is a special edition of Dialogue co-produced by CGTN and Bridge Tank from Paris in France, where we just have this uh, Paris Peace Forum. Welcome to Dialogue. Um, well, Ambassador, I will start with you. The theme of the Paris Peace uh, Forum is uh, seeking common ground in the world of rivalry. I wonder how do you characterize the word rivalry into this world? I think nowadays rivalry and uh, disagreements seem to overshadow the common challenges we're all facing, long-term challenges like uh, climate change, uh, like uh, terrorism, pandemics sometimes. And we tend to forget that beyond all the disputes we can have among our respective countries, we are facing the same challenges for us, for our children, uh, for our grandchildren. And I hope that an event like the Paris Forum will help all people in charge understand that those challenges go far beyond our present possible disagreements. Well, blessing, uh, you know, seeing from your point of view or from where you are from uh, in Africa, if you look at the global situation today, uh, how do you see this rivaling kind of a global competition, whatever words you use, you know, there's this tension there? There have been tension in Africa, like you can see in Ethiopia, in Congo. But right now with the African Union, it's a great place where different African countries can come together. You know, Africa, we have 54 countries. We should go beyond the rivalry and look at how we can come together. Especially in Africa, we're looking at climate change. It's a very key aspect right now. And also in terms of education, uh, recently in UNESCO, they had the educational forum and it was focused on Africa. So the, we really need to focus on the key important issues aside from rivalry. And uh, African Union is doing great in creating that platform for countries to come together and cooperate with each other. Bessie, you mentioned climate change and you and Stefan mentioned about uh, common challenges. Do you see also common points uh, or points in common or common ground in issues like climate change, cyber security, some geographical issues like Ukraine, Gaza, but also chronic instability in some parts of Africa, the Sahel as well, uh, and humanitarian crisis. And, Around those common grounds, do you see an interaction or a danger within the current great powers rivalry? Bessie, Stefan, and possibly Jeremy. Yeah, and I think the, um, today, since in the world, uh, we have a world disorder so which was built probably 60 years ago. And since then, so many countries have developed its own economy like China, India, they become powerful, they like to express their ideas, but in the old you know, systems, they have the same rights as other countries. So I think it's the rivalry comes from that, because it's the, the world is not balanced. So we have to now take into account all these problems you have raised and try to find something balanced for everyone. We, we'll get back to the system and its balance, but, but back to the ground, really, uh, for the nearly everyday life of people. What about the common grounds between cybersecurity, humanitarian issues, risks linked to climate change, not just the politics of climate change, but adaptation, weather, uh, I mean, storms, uh, drownings, and what, would you see any common ground in the different kind of crisis, or are those crises separate? Well, I would say yes and no. In, indeed, in a, in a way they're separate, but there, is, there seems to me at least to, to be a link among all those crises. Let's say climate change. Climate change contributes to uh, desertification, to drought, to floods, to uh, unstable weather, which means that agriculture becomes more difficult, that people have to leave their homes. It leads to migrations. Migrations can destabilize uh, stabilize countries. This can lead to internal disturbances and sometimes even to wars. And part, we know that part of the conflicts is among farmers and people who uh, raise cattle, for instance, because grazing rights are not compatible with agriculture, well, this is a, especially the case in Africa. So here clearly we have, we have a link and this can breed, can create the ground for terrorist movements, 
who exploit the situation in order to disseminate their propaganda and, and seize power. So it's, for, I think, for the entire world and for our respective countries, it's very, it would be difficult and foolish to ignore each separate crisis, but we have to, it is our common interest to try and address them. A very short follow-up. You've been a special envoy on climate right. for the Paris Agreement. Indeed. And you've been a special envoy, or you've accompanied a special envoy in the Middle East. Do you see a connect climate change, the Middle East tensions? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. One already, like, that was a long time ago, in the 90s when I was dealing with the Middle East, water was already a key element of rivalry. Let's, let's take a very precise example. Um, the conflict between Syria and Israel it might become more and more important as um, time goes by because of scarcity of water, because of climate change. So definitely there is a link. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, speak of the common ground, uh, there are some uh, challenging issues, uh, you know, ongoing crisis like in Ukraine, in Gaza, and the U.S., uh, you know, technological containment over China. Uh, we do see now there are tensions also sort of between China and the European Union. So, Ambassador, you know, how do you look at this? Uh, you know, the common interests. We know there are common interests, obviously. For example, commercial interests between China and the European uh, Union. Absolutely. And how do you see these kind of common interests? And how do you see their differences here? Well, first of all, I'd like to stress that the crises you mentioned are very different. In the case of Ukraine or the case of Gaza, unfortunately, violence is going on. There are a lot of casualties and a lot of human suffering. The tension between the US and China and possible disputes agreements between the EU and China, I thank God, not that serious. I mean, obviously, they, we have to tackle them, we have to take them seriously, but it has never been, the use of violence or force has never been envisaged. We're still friendly countries, we have good relations together, even when we have disputes. I think it's to a large extent a question of trust. We don't know each other enough. We don't talk to each other enough. Um, and we are not on both all sides. We're not enough conscious of the common interests we have, especially long-term interests for our future generations, for our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremy, you have been following, obviously, European Union development, French development, and also the Chinese market closely, uh, some of the industries in particular. Uh, how do you look at the differences nowadays, you know, uh, the competition between, say, the EU and, uh, and China? Is that, uh, you know, the same rivalry or same differences, uh, like as other kind of challenges, like, uh, you know, people say, zero-sum conference, uh, zero-sum competition? Is that that kind of nature? Um... I think the, uh, for, for China and Europe, uh, certainly we have a lot of differences, uh, but still we have a lot of common interests. Yeah. For example, in the uh, automotive industry, yeah. in the automotive industries, uh, I think today the European Union has launched an, an inquiry about its, you know, subsidies to the Chinese economy and the Chinese industry, EV. Right? Yeah, EV. Mm. Um, I don't think that this is a good way. From my perspective, I don't, because, first of all, uh, in Europe, the major three German car makers, they have more than 33% of their sales is done in China, okay? And also France, for example, we have Stellantis, who has a huge, you know, business relationships with the new, uh, uh, new partners, uh, Leap Moto. Uh, and Renault also has just created a joint ventures with Geely. Uh, so our business uh, interests are strongly linked strongly linked. So I think the European people, they need the Chinese market. Chinese, they need the European technologies. So if we, we can work together, we will make our cake bigger and we can make more you know, benefits for each other. You mentioned the technology. Yeah. Just for uh, purpose of clarification, yeah. are you talking about the EV? You know, in that sense, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, you know, uh, the technology in terms yeah. of electric vehicles and also batteries, I think they are in the leading position here. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in 2012, China has the choice to select, to, to, to take the decisions among three options. One is like Europeans to make the thermal engines more efficient. This is one option. 
The second option is the Japanese option, is the high, hybrid option in old engines with electric engines and the third one is the electric engines so the chinese they have decided to work only on the electric engines okay electric cars and today china is the leading uh, player in the world uh, in, the, in the world because you see look at the 10 biggest uh, battery makers six are the chinese and the best technologies today comes from China. So this is the good way for the Europeans, especially for the Frenchmen, Stellantis or Renault, to work with the Chinese, to learn from the China. And the China also, they can learn from the Chinese, uh, from the Europeans. For example, uh, even in the automotive industries, the chips, for example, in the cars, you have a lot of chips. And the, the French companies, SD Microelectronics, they are the leaders, and the Chinese can learn from them. So when we work together, and we can grow together. Jeremy, what you mentioned is very important because peace comes also through trade, through good economic relations. But the examples you gave call for a lot of investment. If we stick to the EU-China relation, two years ago, uh, the investment agreement that was under its way got derailed for uh, geostrategic reasons. Do you feel now that at a time uh, when crises multiply in the world, the bilateral relations, which ought to be only discussing about bilateral matters, might be influenced by third-party questions, like the questions of Ukraine and of the difference of position between the EU and China on the Ukraine, or the Russian war in Ukraine. Do you think that the situation in the Middle East uh, might derail also the generic trust, uh, and that the US new role, refound role in the world, uh, might also influence the bilateral relationship. Can we have those technological choices without investment? Can we have investment without trust? Can we have this trust in a world of crisis? I, I think the, in the life there are always some problems, some conflicts. It's normal. Uh, it's a part of our life. So we should focus on what is the most important for uh, our relationships with, with, between the Europe and, and, and China. I think the Europe and China should give the example to the world. We have differences, but we, we must build you know, these common interests and build our relationships. i just give you an example. example okay? uh, all, over the world, all over the world, people need investments, people need jobs. China and Europe today, we are two powerhouse. We have technology, we have money, and if, if we can develop the good relations, we can help everyone, people you know, everywhere. And this is our mission, to build trust in the world through our cooperation. Stefan, you want, I saw you wanted to react. Yeah, indeed. I'd just like to add one element. You mentioned the word uh, trust. I think it's quite important. I think one of the elements which can explain the difficulties we are facing now is a lack of confidence and also a lack of mutual recognition of the rules of the game. One element which, con which contributes to that, as at least on the European side, is the fear of dependency. I mean, there's a problem of uh, rare minerals, rare earths, and so on. i just give you an example. Uh, recently, um, the Netherlands decided to veto the ex exports of uh, semiconductors to China. Mm -hmm. And China took retaliatory measures and uh, pro prohibited the export of two minerals, germanium and gallium, to the whole of the European Union. Now this is the kind of measures and countermeasures which can, which can be indeed detrimental. But if we could manage to eliminate that fear of dependency, perhaps also by encouraging other sources so that we could balance our imports, our exports and the use of minerals, perhaps that trust could disappear. But rules of the game on both sides should be clearer. I noticed your answer was purely bilateral. Bilateral issues, bilateral trust, bilateral solutions. No influence or no pervasive uh, uh, triggering no, effect. The, the world is uh, not that uh, simple. Uh, out, <laughs> out of, that is a question, right? As someone from that continent, how do you see this kind of a competition? For Africa, the continent itself, we need to look at how we can both benefit. It shouldn't be just one way, come and get the resources and then leave the African continent. I think that's one area in which the Chinese contribution is undoubtedly very positive. And, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. But, but before we are touching upon that, you know, uh, blessing here we also see you know there's competition sometimes you can say cooperation for example between china and the french companies uh working together in europe uh, in the african continent you know under the uh, belt and road initiative but mostly we see competition you know like uh, oh china is increasing the influence in the african continent you know european countries feel a sense of urgency we need to do something to compete with the chinese as someone from that continent how do you see this kind of competition I think we should firstly look at the reason why they are interested in Africa. Africa is a con continent with so many resources. And at this moment, China, yes, have a long history with Africa. They supported the liberation of Africa years ago during the Cold War. And also Africa also played a role in 1971 during the veto for the... Yeah, voting China yeah. back into the US So they've, they've had a long history together. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. China supported and then Africa supported. Support. In terms of competition and cooperation, France has also history. Colonial masters, they co colonized <laughs> 20 <laughs> countries. So they have the historical ties behind uh, with, uh, with African countries and all. But for Africa, the continent itself, we need to look at how we can both benefit. It shouldn't be just one way, come and get the resources and then leave the African continent stranded. Most African countries, they don't really appreciate the fact that the Western countries interfere in the political aspect of Africa. But how is it sustainable for the African continent, especially when we have bad leaders? I mean, now it is great that the Chinese government doesn't interfere in the political as aspect of uh, Africa. But I think in the long term, where we have leaders that are not in support like democracy, just want to have a, uh, that's why we have the coup. Mm -hmm. When leaders stays for a longer period of time. So I feel like African continent needs to look at the values of these European countries also need to look at the interest. How is it also going to benefit the African continent itself? And uh, yeah, can, can we say we? Um, I guess we can all agree upon that. You know, it's up to the African nations, sovereign nations, to make the decision in what way and with which to cooperate, and uh, with their own interests in mind. Uh, ultimately, it's their decision. And of course, in a very mutually beneficial way, mm. or multi uh, win, yeah. win, I mean, for oh, everybody, win yes. Situation. Can I add one element? I mean, for, coming from our limited experience in Africa, I think there's one area in which the Chinese contribution is undoubtedly very positive infrastructures. I mean, I've yeah. seen that. From, I was supposed in Ethiopia for four years. Mm -hmm. I mean, now there's, there's a, a, new, um, uh, a, a new metro uh, in Addis Ababa. Uh, it's not underground, it's, uh, uh, but it's a train connection which links both sides of Addis Ababa. Built by the Chinese is working very well. The new ra railway between Addis Ababa and Djibouti was also built yes. by, by, yeah. the, by the Chinese. The, uh, there's a kind of motorway going all around the city, also built by the Chinese. This is positive, we have to admit it. Uh, one area in which perhaps some progress could be expected is the financial area, a uh, debt issue. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some progress there as well. Recently, there was an agreement on the restructuring of the Zambian de debt. Yes. That's very positive. But still, many African countries are still hugely indebted to China. And we hope, we started already, but we have to push it further. We hope that there will be more cooperation between China on one hand and other creditors, especially Western countries, in order to tackle the, the issue Paris, of African yeah. Paris Club exactly, yeah. tackle the African yes. uh, debt issue together. Yeah, that's a long-term issue, but because of the pandemic, because of yep. the interest increase in, for example, in Washington, it, 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 it's act, actual burden for a lot of developing countries. Uh, but then speak of Washington, Ambassador, you know, recently we have seen frequent visits by senior officials from Washington, from Beijing with the, to each other. Yes. And we are seeing the warming up of this relationship a little bit. Uh, you know, people say they are trying to stabilize in the relationship. Will that kind of a warming up somehow affect probably uh, in a positive way the relationship between Brussels and China and Beijing? Well, you will correct me if I, you, do, you do disagree, but yeah, I would say definitely yes, certainly. Now, we don't need the U.S. to determine our own policy, obviously. The U.S. is an ally, is a close friend, but Europe, European Union is independent. 
But the warming up of relations between the US and China, if it is confirmed, is per se positive, and we will certainly welcome it. And there, all, there have also been visits by uh, high-ranking uh, European officials, um, um, like uh, George, uh, Borrell, for instance, who yes. went to China recently. I think he spent four days in, 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 in yeah. China. That's very Multiple positive cities. as well. Yeah. So it all goes in the same direction. We will continue to have disagreements. By this is in inevitable, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't prevent us from working together. Together. What is the trend you see till date? I think the trend is towards a more um, a greater role of those emerging countries in world affairs. When the crisis is over, things will be different. We need Russia. Russia is a great country. We, we, we've had always good relations with Russia. A multipolar world can be indeed very useful. The world should not be dominated by one country, but by the cooperation of all countries. The global South are seeing it differently from the West. They are seeing the West is a practicing double standard. People who see in every corner in this world are informed basically by the Western media. In the Southern countries, we have to develop our own media, you know, to have their own impact in the world. Otherwise, it's, we rely only on some major media. It's our, our views, it's our biased. Yeah, basically, the international community, fortunately, is not just about great powers rivalry, it's also about the United Nations. We've seen, though, in these United Nations recently a lot of divide on those so-called votes on Ukraine, votes on Gaza, and there is this rising idea that there would be a rift between the global south and the west or the global north. How do you see that? And how should the global south find better ways to express its own ideas rather than just answer to the questions raised by the west? I think one mistake we do is classify Africa as one nation, but Africa is, we have 54 countries with different national interests. So we can't have one voice representing Africa. It's, an, it's impossible. Ukraine, for example, is the basket of bread where most African countries really rely on Ukraine in terms of the grain and the bread issue. So I think the United Nations needs to give Africa countries, not just AU, or to really air their voice and really hear what they have to say because different countries have national interests, have also economic interests in mind and political interests and historical interests that they have to consider. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a complex relation that needs to be considered within the different African countries. Recently, uh, India chaired the G20 and was able to frame an agreement for a corridor to the Middle East. Earlier to that, uh, China was instrumental in uh, cracking an agreement between the Saudis and Iran, which uh, surprised uh, quite a few people. What is the role uh, we can foresee for the large emerging powers uh, in the global diplomatic order? Well, I think those emerging powers will and should play a growing role. And they have, indeed, they can contribute to improving international relations and solving the crisis. You know, when I was dealing with African issues, sometimes we would have what we call contact groups mm -hmm. on certain crises, Guinea, for instance. We would have the UN, we have the African Union, we have the European Union, we would have uh, Francophonie. But countries like India or China were not participating. Mm. And I think it's a pity because Chinese diplomacy is very efficient, Indian diplomacy is very efficient, they have a large influence, and clearly there should be more cooperation among all p powers or countries, big or small countries in the world, to help, help push things forward. So I would, but this is personal, uh, personal comment obviously, um, but I would certainly welcome that trend. And I hope this, this influence can, be, can work for the, for the best of all people. That's your welcome as an informed uh, practitioner. What is the trend you see till date? I think the trend is towards a more, um, a greater role of those emerging countries in the world affairs and provided, obviously, uh, relations uh, remain friendly, uh, positive, and peaceful, 
that role can be very useful. Now, obviously, it depends on the way each country conducts its own policy. When we see at the foolish aggression, when we look at the foolish aggression of Russia against Ukraine, we think, oh my God, we hope that influence, the present influence of Russia will not be too great. When the crisis is over, things will be different. We need Russia. Russia is a great country. We, we, we've had always good relations with Russia. What they're doing right now is absolutely insane. We hope it won't last uh, too much. We speak a lot about multipolarization, about a multipolar world. A multipolar world can be indeed very useful. The world should not be dominated by one country, but by the cooperation of all countries. Well, uh, can I add something to this uh, talk of um, you know the global south? I think you know when it comes to the issues, specific issues like on the Ukraine crisis, on the Gaza crisis, you do see the rise of uh, the global south or the divide, divisiveness between global south and the West in general. Uh, because some people would point to, they say, you know, they criticize the West. For example, Ukraine crisis is in the yard, backyard of the European Union. It's in the West, so people see it, you know, vividly, and they f they feel that, you know, the crisis, they feel the burden, they feel the trouble. But when it comes to the U.S. in, you know, having war with other countries like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, people say, well, there are no sanctions against Americans. There are no isolation against Americans. And the Gaza crisis, uh, Europeans would say, well, uh, you know, we feel there's a genocide of the Ukrainian civilians being killed by the Russians. But when it comes to the Gaza crisis, you know, 10,000 civilians were killed. More than 4,000 of them are children. Are we seeing the similar criticism? Are we seeing people calling that genocide from the West? Yemen has a tragic situation. Yeah. The People Eastern are Africa that, you know, home. Global South are seeing it differently from the West. They are seeing the West is a practicing double standard. Ambassador, how do you see that? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it's inevitable for people to be more focused on the, the immediate surroundings. I mean, Ukraine is a European country, it's close to our border. You know, if things go havoc in Ukraine, other European countries could be threatened. Poland, for instance, Czech Republic, Moldavia, and so on. It's very close to our borders. If things are farther from us, we tend indeed to pay less attention, which is, I agree with you, very unfortunate. In Africa, there are terrible crises going on. I mean, one, in one, one country is particularly dear to me, Ethiopia, because I was posted there. And the recent civil war in Ethiopia caused between 400 and 800,000 casualties. Yeah. And nobody speaks about it. It's a pity. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think the, um, until now, since the Western media are the most powerful, influential in the world. People since in every corner in this world since are informed basically by the Western media. So in this case today in Gaza, the Chinese TikTok is, has provided some interesting information shared by many, many peoples, okay? I think the, in, the, uh, in Africa, also in Middle East, in the southern countries, we have to develop our own media, you know, to have their own impact in the world. Otherwise, it's, we rely only on some major media, it's on our views, it's our bias. I think now we have a good beginning to have other voices than the uh, your mainstreams coming from the USA or something like that. Yeah. With that, we are coming to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. Special thanks to Bridge Tank, our partner here. I'm Xu Jingbo. I'm Joy Thanks for watching. See you next time.